Okay, everybody, let's go. I hope you're all set to go. Yeah. What did you do last night? Who lit candles for you? Me. Did you like your own candles? My son lit them. I was baking yesterday because I'm going to Borough Park tonight for a Hanukkah party with the family that I stayed with. And I was making a Hungarian uh, dessert for them. Oh, did you bring us a sample? <laughs> I'm sorry. Oh. I'd like to change. What's it called, your Hungarian dessert? So in Hungarian, it's called um, Orangaluska, wow. but it's like a pulled apart cake oh. with uh, vanilla on top. And it's kind of like donuts. But with is it fried? Sugar, no, 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 it's fake. With sugar and uh, and the walnuts. Oh, that sounds so good. Why didn't you bring it? <laughs> next time, next time, I promise. I'm Thank you. you. Okay. <laughs> Leia. Good morning. Um, you know, about you, I'd like to ask you to sit on the end of the table. Yes. The end. Oh, yeah. Yes. Because oh, okay. where you are, you're blocking Leia. Yeah, now when uh, Shoshana comes, she won't know where to sit. No, no, she's sitting here now. She'll sit there. Good. So when Malka comes, she won't know where to sit. She's sitting there. Malka started today over here. We're all good. Today. She was there last week also. 
Okay. So yesterday we were talking about the idea. It's the only idea because we can't understand it. That Hashem is in the words of Maimonides, the knowledge, the knower, and the thing known. And by knowing himself, since he's the source and of life of everything, by knowing himself, he knows everything. <clears throat> so he's the knowledge. Any subject you want to talk about, he knows it. He created that knowledge. That knowledge is a creation of his. He knows it. He possesses the knowledge. He's the one who knows the thing. And he is the thing. Hashem is the world, the world, but the world is not his place. He is the place of the world, but the world is not his place. That's a saying of the, our sages in, in the tractate about Pesach. Hashem is the place of the world, but the world is not his place. And <clears throat> we see that he, uh, just like Hashem is infinite believe without any limitation without any end without any limits so to anything about him is without any limits so his wisdom is without limit <clears throat> his understanding is without limit his knowledge is without limit so how can we ever know it we know him we cannot and so it says on page 83 his greatness can never be Fathomed, and no thought can ever grasp him. His thoughts, we try to match our thoughts with his thoughts, that they should be harmonious, they should, that our thoughts should be based on his thoughts. <clears throat> but his thoughts are not our thoughts. <clears throat> Uh, a person who used to take care of the Rebbe's house, you know, the Rebbe would not be at home very much. His wife gave him away to the Hasidim so that he could devote himself to the Hasidim and to the, the needs of the Hasidim. When someone asked her, where are your children? She said, my children are all in 770. So someone had to be at home to take care of things. <clears throat> One of these people told me one time, Hanukkah time, <clears throat> it says, when we light the Hanukkah menorah, we put on a garful. And this person who was taking care of the house noticed that the Rebbe didn't put on a garful. So he, he went over to the Rebbe or he happened to be by the Rebbe, he said, I noticed that you didn't put on a gargle, even though it's written in the book of customs that we do put on a gargle when we light the menorah. Probably that was because you're wearing a gargle underneath your shirt. It's a custom to put us something around the tzitzis that we wear under the shirt, like a, a string belt called a gargle. The word gargle means, like the English word girdle, something that surrounds that <clears throat> which is inside. And the Rebbe looked at him very sharply and said, quoted this verse, my thoughts are not your thoughts. He said he never asked the Rebbe about anything he did again. Never asked again. The Rebbe just said, my thoughts are not your thoughts. There's a, in other words, there's a reason for what I do, but don't try to imagine what, you know, what the reason for what the reasons are. <clears throat> so that's said about the Abish, about the Almighty, and Sadiqim are like the, the Almighty. Our thoughts cannot contain the Rebbe's thoughts. And then it goes on, similarly concerning his understanding, there's no limit to the depth of the Abish's understanding. In the middle of page 83, Right. So then the question is, <clears throat> oh, and it goes on, if a person will search to discover the source of the Almighty's uh, knowledge, you'll never, you'll never get there. 
because my thoughts are not your thoughts, says the Almighty to us in the prof, the writings about Eov, in English called Job. Next step is that we have to understand that even though now that we understand the greatness of, of Hashem's thought, the greatness of his intellect, so our sages said, an extraordinary thing, an extraordinary principle here. I never saw this anywhere else. In the place where you find Hashem's greatness, you are contemplating, you are gazing at something that's so way, so far beyond your own capabilities of understanding. Say so the sages, what you are really looking at is not the, the greatness of Hashem. You are looking at his humility. Whoa. But these are two opposites. Why is it when I contemplate the greatness of Hashem, when I happen to be, for instance, an, a peak overlooking the ocean, beautiful, a beautiful place, and I, I'm there in the evening, I see the sunset, or I'm there in the morning, I see the sun rise. It's a beautiful sunset, a beautiful sunrise. And I behold the greatness of Hashem. Say the sages, you're not beholding the greatness of Hashem. To you, it looks like his greatness because you're very small. But what you are looking at is his humility. What is his humility? Why would it, what's, where's humility here? What's humility all about? Rocho, you have an idea? Why is this Hashem's humility? Maybe because it's like, like a sort of vulnerability, like he's like, like a sort of vulnerability because he's like showing you a part of himself that you're putting the I think you're putting your finger on it. You're very close there. He's showing you part of himself, but not the whole of himself. That what you're perceiving is not the whole of what Hashem is. So what are you perceiving? You're perceiving a very limited view of what Hashem is. And that limited view is connected with the whole of him. but it's a limited view. How does he limit this view? That's a big question in Jewish thought. How does Hashem limit himself to the extent that we can perceive him, that we can perceive his greatness or we can perceive his wisdom or we can, get to, we can come to know his will? And the answer is, that's his humility. As great as he is, he makes himself very small so that we can perceive him. There's a, a metaphor for this, an image. You're listening, Chaya, you with me? A father loves his young child. He comes home from work, he's tired, he sees his child, he is refreshed. He gets down on his hands and knees on the floor and he plays with the child. Why does he do this? Because he loves the child, it's his child. And he talks to the child, but the child doesn't have a language yet. So what does he say to the child? He makes noises. He makes childish noises because he loves the child. And the child understands that he's expressing his love to him. So Hashem gets, brings himself down, limits himself to the extent that we can perceive him. How does he limit himself? He limits himself because he takes his will the way he wants things to be. He takes his wisdom and he contracts it into 613 mitzvahs. And every one of these mitzvahs is him, is part of him. And when we do a mitzvah, we're connecting with him, with his essence. Because what you want, that's who you are. So what Hashem wants, that's who he is. And so he enables us to connect to his very essence 
by giving us these 613 commandments. And each of these commandments is so wise, so infinitely wise, just as his wisdom is infinite, there's infinite wisdom in any one of these commandments. And so the commentaries go to town explaining to us all the levels and ways that we can understand <clears throat> any one of the mitzvahs. Like we said earlier in this chapter, Pardes, the orchard of, of, the, of the Torah is the simple meaning of a mitzvah, the hinted meaning of a mitzvah, the ethical meaning of a mitzvah, the mystical meaning of a mitzvah, all these levels. And each of these levels contains levels. Levels upon levels. And they're all one thing. And he puts himself into all of these levels so that we can have a relationship with him. So that's what it says, the place where you perceive his greatness, what you're really perceiving <clears throat> is his humility, that he makes himself small and he contracts himself into 613 mitzvahs. Page 84, see it? Top of the page, where you find the greatness of Hashem, there you find his humility. He contracted, he condensed his wisdom and his will into the 613 commandments of the Torah. Now these commandments, how do we know how to do them? Our sages teach us all the details. These details are called halachas. <clears throat> and each of these halachas is part of Hashem. Every halacha contains his wisdom, his will, and his wisdom. For instance, let's take the mitzvah of tefillin. <coughs> what do we want our tefillin? We take the Shema, which is the declaration of the <coughs> unity of God. Hear, O Israel, Hashem is our God. That's statement number one. We have to know that Hashem is our God. And we have no other God other than him, heaven forbid. And he is one. We, we reject the whole concept of many gods. <clears throat> or a three-part God. Or a God, a, a, a father, son, relationship, and so on. That we, we believe in the Son of God, and we worship, worship him. No, that's idolatry. <clears throat> That's statement number one. And then we learned in the very first class, the first word of the Shema is Shin Mem Ayin, Shema. And the Shema, yeah, you need this cream these days with the heating systems and your hands get dried out. <clears throat> Yeah. yeah. It says, the, the, the word Shema stands for the, 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 the verse, lift from the prophet Isaiah, lift up your eyes on high, and behold, who created all this? That's our exercise every morning to look up at the Shemayim and see what's going on up there to remember something greater than ourselves. And that's why we always wear a head covering. <laughs> and it contains the Shema contains within it within the Tefillin going out of Egypt the start the Exodus that we put on Tefillin every day so that we should always remember that we were slaves to Pharaoh in the land of Egypt and with signs and wonders, the great signs and wonders, Hashem took us out of there and to become his people, that he should give us his laws, that we should connect to him through keeping his laws. And we put this, the, the, it's mentioned four times in the Torah, which corresponds to the four letters of Hashem's name. Just like a square has four sides. Exactly four times in the Torah. There are four paragraphs where the Shema is mentioned. And these four paragraphs correspond to the four expressions of redemption that the Torah has. 
Hashem, and that corresponds to the four cups of wine that we drink at the Seder service, which celebrates the Exodus. And that, corres that corresponds to the four kingdoms, the four great kingdoms that oppressed the Jewish people and from which we were redeemed four times with the ultimate redemption still to come with Mashiach. <clears throat> and the more we go into the laws of tefillin, the more we will perceive the, the beauty. Every single letter has to be exactly the way it is. If two letters touch, for instance, the tefillin is not, not, is not kosher. Why? Because every letter has to be surrounded by white. Because it has to be an exact number of letters. And if two letters touch, it's not an exact number of letters anymore. So how do you know it's an exact letter? Because it has to be surrounded by white. What's the white? White is the parchment. And in order we should see it, the white of the letter has to be black. It can't be red or blue or green or brown or orange. It has to be black. So we have to make black ink. How do we make black ink? Oh, that's a whole process that scribes know about with galbanum, a certain kind of nut. with which they make this very, very black ink. Why does it have to be each single letter exactly the way it is? Because every letter is a whole world into itself with a thorn on top, indicating that it comes from way above anything that we can know. Every single letter begins with a thorn, a little spike sticking up. Then there are other letters that require more thorns some have two and some have three. And if the thorns aren't on the letters, you know what you've got? You don't have a mezuzah. Well, you have a mezuzah, but it's not, it's not functional. The function of the mezuzah is to protect you. The function of the mezuzah is to protect your home and the people in the home, whether they're at home or whether they go out. Wherever they are. If you don't have these thorns on top of the letters, it's like having a Rolls Royce or a Cadillac or a Lexus with no gas. You got a beautiful car, it doesn't go. Mizusa doesn't do his job. And the Mizusa has to be on every doorpost except for the bathroom or a barn where animals stay. It has to be a place where people live. Oh, it doesn't have to be on a closet if the closet's very small, but if you can walk into the closet, then it does have to be there. Do we have to put mezuzah in the garage? Yes. Huh. If you use the garage, yeah, you have to put a mezuzah on the garage. And it has to be on the right side as you go in. You don't write the mezuzah on the doorpost, you write the mezuzah on the parchment and you nail it up on the doorpost. Which doorpost? The right doorpost as you go in. What happens if there's, how do you know which way is in? When you enter your house, you go and go and go and go to the back of the house, right? Yeah, that's it. Okay. If the door opens, then the way the door opens, that's the way you go in. What if there's no door? So in my house, at the end of the first floor, comes the kitchen. Where does the mezuzah go? On the way into the kitchen? I ask the rabbi. On the way, it's more important. No? On the right as you go into the kitchen? Wrong. Why? What is it? Wait, what? Because the rabbi said, your direction of movement should be from the room with less holiness to the room of greater holiness. What's the room? What room is more important? The room where you make Shabbos and say Torah or the room where you cook? So therefore the mezuzah has to be on the right of the door leading from the kitchen into the dining room. If you're learning, you do most of your learning and teaching in the dining room, then you have to, you're going into the dining room. So it has to be on the right side as you go into the dining room, unless you have a door. 
maybe a swinging door between the dining room and the kitchen. Okay, which side is it swinging from? Well, maybe that's a right. Maybe it's like, these are all questions that express and convey the will of Hashem. And like I said, there's so many levels of knowledge and every single detail is has within it the will and the wisdom of Hashem, which is infinite. And it has to be over your heart that this concept of the unity of Hashem should be over your heart 24-7. And that should be enough to, to hold you in check like a horse has to have reins to hold him in check. It shouldn't run wild. It should go on the course where the driver, where the rider wants it to go. So this should hold you in check that you should go where Hashem wants you to go. But that's not enough. It has to be over your head. It says between your eyes. Where is between your eyes? My nose is between my eyes. You don't put the tefillin on your nose. Where does the tefillin have to go? The tefillin has to go on top of your head between your eyes. Not on your forehead. Sometimes you see people with the tefillin like that. Hanging down almost to their eyes. No, the tefillin has to be on top of the head, over your brains. And the four parshas, the four times tefillin are mentioned, are going to be over the four aspects of your brain. Where do I have four aspects of my brain? Well, I have a right side, that's one. I have a left side, that's two. Then I have the back, that's three. That corresponds to inspiration, development, knowledge. The back is knowledge. Knowledge is connection. Adam, the first man, knew his wife. They had children. So knowledge is connection. You can't have children without connection. Husband and wife have to connect in order to have children. So when you can, your knowledge connects you to the thoughts of the greatness of Hashem, which contains within it the unity of Hashem and the redemption that Hashem took us out of Egypt, that we should be his people with signs and wonders that teach us about his greatness. And then it, we connect to it. So we're always thinking about it. It's always in our mind. We never forget who we are and what we represent and what is our purpose in the world, which is to be proclaim and declare in everything we do the <clears throat> unity of God and the straps that hold the tefillin on our head come and make a knot and the knot is square just like the tefillin are square and from the knot comes out two straps one strap for the right side and one strap for the left side so we have four parshas four paragraphs one paragraph is for the right side that's the Shema, that's about the love of Hashem. And the other paragraph is for the left side, which is about the mitzvahs that we take upon ourselves, the mitzvahs of Hashem, love of Hashem, and fear of Hashem. It goes on and on. <clears throat> so that we have right side, left side, and back, which is knowledge, which divides into two, which is das, divides into chesed and gevura. And then there are two other levels which correspond to higher levels of spirituality, higher than chachma and bina. Where do they come from? That's from kadesh, word sanctify, which is a high, very, very high, high level. Just like in the soul, you have nefesh, ruch, and the shamas, three levels. And then you have high and yechidas, two higher ones, and so on. So we take any one mitzvah like this. <clears throat> oh, and I was also on this point. I want to bring up something else, a very, very interesting idea. Why is it that each letter has to be separate? Because if we don't have all the letters separate, <clears throat> we don't have all the words. If two letters touch, the whole Sefer Torah is no good. And the tefillin are no good. They have to be fixed. Because then you don't have enough letters, you don't have enough words. It's exact number of letters uh, 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 corresponding to the exact number of souls that went out of Egypt. 
600,000 letters in the Torah correspond to 600,000 souls of people who went out of Egypt. Are you going to count the letters? It's not going to be 600,000. So there's a way of doing it. The sages do it that they count the vowels as well. It comes out to be exactly 600,000 for 600,000. And these are general souls. The general 600,000 souls come from the 70 souls of Yaakov's family that went down to Egypt, which come from the three fathers and the four mothers of the Jewish people. Every single one is a distinct individual, a distinct entity. We have to have every single one of them. So every letter has to be surrounded by white. Now, when Moshe Rabbeinu went up into heaven to get the Torah, what did he see? When Hannah Ruman was sitting here and her brother had this before he was even knew anything of you all heard him or what she said, that he's had a vision. He had a vision of the Torah, which was black letters on white parchment, only the black letters were fire, black fire on white fire. Where do you see black fire when you light your candle Friday nights? Or even tonight, you light the candles of the, of the menorah. Near the wick, it's black. Because that's connected with the physical world. The higher you go, the brighter it is, the hotter it is, until the heat, you don't even see it at the high, hottest point. So the, the Torah, the way it was in, in heaven, the way Hashem was writing the Torah, so to speak, in heaven with a quill fire, a quill pen of, not from a bird, a quill of fire, which was writing letters with black fire on white fire. But which is higher, the white fire or the black fire? In the candle, the white fire is much higher, hotter. So that's why every letter has to be surrounded by white fire. Just like when we study about the greatness of Hashem, we study about, we think about how Hashem fills the whole world with life. That's like the black fire. And then we realize that that's not Hashem. Hashem is much greater than that. That's like the white fire. The white fire stands for a surrounding, encompassing level, transcendent level of godliness. So the Tefillin, and Mezuzah, Sefer Torah are like in heaven, black fire on white fire. And that's why they have to be on white parchment with <laughs> totally blacking. It's not going to fade. It's not going to run and lose its very distinct shape. And it's going to have the thorns on it these little swords at the top, and so on. So Hashem contracted, contracts his infinite wisdom into 613 mitzvahs, and every single mitzvah has so many laws. And each law is so deep, has so much that we can learn from it. Mm. And the stories of the Torah, also full of meaning and wisdom, every single detail of them. Page 84. So we have 613 commandments in the Torah, which correspond to how do you like that one? So the 613 parts of our body. The 248 limbs, we learned this already in the earlier part of this chapter, chapter four. The 248 positive commandments, correspond to 248 limbs in the human body. And the 365 negative commandments correspond to the 365 days in a year. And the 365 veins and sinew systems that connect our bones to our, to our flesh. <clears throat> so that our physical body really corresponds to a spiritual body called the divine man. What is the divine man? The image of God is the commandments. And that's not all. Then we have all the other books of the Torah, 19 other books, making a total of 24 books in the Torah, the writings, and the prophets. And every single letter in these writings is part of his will and his knowledge. It's not just haphazard history as it was written down. It's every, every letter is sanctified, is holy, and full of wisdom and teachings. And not only that, 
But we learn that if you have two words with the same letters, there's a connection. No, there's no accidents. If two, two a, a set of letters can make two or three or four words, they're all connected. For instance, the arch enemy of the Jewish people, come to the story of Purim, the arch enemy of the Jewish people at that time was Haman, or like to say Haman. Haman was a descendant of Amalek, who was Amalek. Amalek was the bastard son, grandson of Asa. His son, Eliphaz, had an affair with his wife, his mother, his, his father's wife, and they bore the bastard. Eli <clears throat> Eliphaz was himself an illegitimate child, and he had other illegitimate children after him. And one of them was Amalek. And Moloch is the arch enemy of the Jewish people. When the Jewish people left Egypt, everybody was afraid to touch them. They destroyed the Egyptian empire, lay in ruins. Everybody was afraid to start up with them. Came Amalek and attacked the Jewish people. They lost, but they, they showed the world that you could attack the Jews. There are people who fight with the Jews because they have a reason. They don't like Jews, or they're afraid, whatever. Amalek attacks the Jews just because, for no reason at all. If we add up the letters of Amalek, what do they add up to? They add up to a number 240, which is the same as the word for Suffolk, doubt. When a person has doubts, that's Amalek. Anyway, but the, I see that the, we're going on and on and the class is over. So the main point is that where do we, how do we contact, what is it, what do we see? We see the greatness of Hashem. It's not just that we see it, but that he enables us to see it because it contracts his greatness, his will and his knowledge and his understanding into the 613 commandments of the Torah and six and all the laws that go with these commandments and all the combinations and permutations of the letters of the 24 books of the Torah, which is infinite, as they are taught to us by our sages in the, in the Holy Medrash, <clears throat> so that every single one of us can learn them and thereby become connected to the will and the wisdom of Hashem, and we have a relationship. Thank you very much. Thank you. A happy Hanukkah, everybody. So when you light the menorah, you have to know that this is what's going on. You are fulfilling the will and the wisdom of Hashem, celebrating the great victory of the Jewish people over those people who wanted to prevent us from keeping Torah and mitzvahs in a most miraculous way. And we learn the fundamental lesson of our Jewish life, which is that our lives are a miracle. We've all experienced miracles. Every single one of you here in this class is experiencing a miracle. You experienced the miracle to get here, maybe other miracles too that you know about. And you will go on to experience miracles because your life is of a participates in a miraculous order of things. <coughs> Thank you very much. A happy Hanukkah. We'll see you tomorrow. Bezos Hashem. Thank you, Rabbi. Happy Hanukkah. <laughs>